if you do me a favor and find Second Samuel 15 and then uh, turn with me to John's Gospel and chapter number 10. I'd like to read just a couple of verses out of John's Gospel chapter 10 to set the stage for what I'll be preaching out of in 2 Samuel chapter 15 for the remainder of the service tonight. But 2 Samuel 15 is where we'll head to in just a few minutes. But I'd like to begin reading a couple of verses that I believe we can find parallel and corollary with in, uh, in John chapter number 10 tonight. John's Gospel chapter number 10, I'd like to begin reading. In verse number 9, the Lord Jesus Christ said this, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. And can I say that's still the only way that any man enters in? It's through the door. You don't come by the window. You don't come by the fire escape. You come by the door. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the door this evening. He said, if any man comes by me, he'll be saved. Shall go in and out and find pasture. Now, notice verse 10. This is what I brought you to John 10 for. The thief cometh not but for to, notice this word tonight, steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Here in the text we find that the Lord highlights two characters in these passages. One is himself and the other is the enemy of your soul, the hater of all things that God loves, and that is the devil tonight. The Bible says about Satan in verse number 10 that he is a thief and his sole goal in life and his sole purpose in life is to steal good things that God wants to put in your life tonight and then kill your life and then destroy your life. Now with that in mind, I want you to go back to 2 Samuel with me. 2 Samuel in chapter number 15 tonight. And I want to draw some comparisons from that idea that the devil is a thief and he comes to steal tonight. 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse number 1. If you found your place there, say amen. And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man that had a controversy came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, Of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is of one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said, Moreover, O oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. Notice verse 6, our text tonight. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that came to the king for judgment. So Absalom, just like the devil, stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And for a few minutes tonight, I'd like to preach on this subject to your heart. Don't let the devil steal your heart. Don't let the devil steal your heart. Here in 2 Samuel chapter 15, we find that Absalom comes back after some years being in exile away from the kingdom and away from his daddy, David. But when he comes back, preacher Foster, he does not come back with good intentions. He doesn't come back with pure motives. He doesn't come back with the intention to be a blessing to his daddy's kingdom and to try and be a help and an encouragement to what his daddy is doing. Instead, he immediately starts to go about to subvert 
and if I can use this word that you'll remember the Bible ties us to Satan with, he begins to subtly work on the hearts of the men of Israel and do a work that is trying to steal away what God has divinely handed into the reign and the possession and the kingdom of King David and that is these men of Israel. And here I find Absalom is a picture of the devil tonight. Can I say the devil is everything that I hate this evening? I mean, brother Christian, everything the devil is is everything that I can't stand. The first time we find the devil show up in the Bible, he shows up as a serpent. The Bible said the serpent, Genesis 3, was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He shows up as a snake. I can't stand snakes. Live ones, real ones, dead ones, rubber ones, fake ones. They're all from hell tonight. There ain't no good snakes. I don't care what they are. You say, well, them black snakes won't hurt you and they put, you know, deal with the bad snakes and all that. Good. They need to do it out yonder in the woods somewhere because when they come up in my yard or God forbid they ever come in my house, I'm just going to set the blessed fire thing on fire, get the insurance money. I ain't staying there no more if there's a snake in the house. If you have a snake as a pet tonight, you need to come down here and let the pastor do an exorcism on you because you got devils and demons tonight. You need to get right with God. Snakes ain't pets tonight, y'all. And the devil is a snake. We find the devil is a liar. I can't stand a liar tonight. The Bible said he's a liar and he's the father of it. I don't, I don't know where this got started at. I think it got started in the charismatic movement and then a bunch of crazy independent Baptists started saying it too. But people said things like this. They say the devil is a lie. The devil is a lie. Can I say he ain't no lie tonight. He's the truth. The devil is real tonight. He's just as real as I am. But the devil is a liar tonight. He ain't no lie. He ain't the figment of my imagination or the boogeyman in the Bible he's the real person but he is a liar and he will lie to you and he will convince you of things that are not true he'll get you turned against the church he'll get you turned against the preacher he'll get you turned against one another he'll get you turned against your husband and your wife he'll get children turned against their parents and he'll even get you turned against God if you give him half a chance tonight he's a liar he's not just a snake he's not just a liar he's a murderer tonight. The Bible said he was a murderer from the beginning. Who do you think it was that put into Cain's heart to murder his own brother? The Bible said Cain was of that wicked one. He had something of the devil that got implanted down in his heart to where he finally murdered his own brother. He's everything that God hates and is everything that I can't stand. And when we look at Absalom tonight, Absalom is a picture of the devil. Absalom is a liar. He says things that's not true. Absalom is a murderer. He murdered his own brother Amnon. Absalom is slick like a snake and he suddenly steals the hearts of the people of God. Can I say Absalom's like the devil? He looks good. Y'all listen to me. The Bible said in chapter number 14, it said that Absalom from the top of his head to the sole of his foot, there was no blemish in him. He was a good looking dude. I mean, brother, he would look good and he had the, abje the object of his rebellion right on top of his head. Had that big long hair way off down here as a symbol of I'm not in under in authority to anyone. And he looked good. Can I say the devil looked good tonight. The Bible said if, if the devil was to show up in this church tonight and walk through them back doors he wouldn't do it with a pitchfork and a horn suit on. He'd show up as an angel of light and be a minister of righteousness. He'd look real good. He'd be the sweetest talking nicest looking sweetest individual in this building. He'd shake your hand smile to your face all the while trying to ruin your home ruin your heart and ruin 
ruin your family behind your back tonight. That's Absalom this evening. And I want you to notice who he's stealing hearts from. Don't miss this now. Don't miss this. You missed the whole message. Look who he's stealing hearts from. He's stealing hearts from David. You say, who is David? David's one of the greatest pictures in the Old Testament of the Lord Jesus Christ. Outside of Joseph, outside of that great picture of Jesus, Joseph, uh, David is one of the greatest types of Jesus Christ in all of the Old Testament. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. We just read it, and we find David is the good shepherd tonight, and we find he lays his life on the line for his sheep. Uh, He fights a lion, and he fights a bear for the safety of the sheep. Jesus Christ, he is the Christ, the anointed of God. David is the anointed uh, that God set over his people. David is the king of Israel. And one day Jesus Christ will sit on the throne of his father David. Jesus is called, uh, he's called the root out of Jesse. And David is the son of Jesse. And we find that Absalom is stealing hearts away from a picture of Jesus Christ. And you listen to me tonight. The devil is out to steal every child of God's heart away from the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, what's he out to do? He's out to steal your purity, young people. He's out to steal your prayer time. He's out to steal your Bible reading time. He's out to steal your walk with God. And the devil will do whatever he has to do to steal from the Lord tonight. Don't let the devil steal your heart. Listen to me. I find this interesting. Do you know why the Bible said that Absalom stole their heart? Because it didn't belong to him. You steal stuff from people that what you get getting that don't belong to you. You steal something that's not yours. You take something that's yours, but you steal something that ain't yours. Can I say these hearts didn't belong to Absalom? They belonged to David. They were the rightful owner of David. David had earned them. David had proved, uh, Brother Phil, that he loved these people. He had proved over and over again that he deserved their allegiance and he deserved their affection. He deserved their heart. And can I say tonight, the devil doesn't deserve your heart. He's never proved anything other than he hates you. I'm glad to report there's a Savior that he has proved over and over. We heard the sister just sing about it. He loved us with all of his heart. He proved with his attitude. He proved with his affection. He proved with his action. He proved with everything about him that he wanted our heart. And according to that Bible, he bought it. He purchased it. He paid for it. The night that I got born again, I believed in my heart that Jesus Christ died, was buried and rose again from my sins and I gave my heart to him and he accepted my heart. How could I ever let the devil get anything that God has bought tonight? But, but we do. The Bible talks about this heart's desperately wicked and deceitful above all things and it's prone to wonder. Tonight, I just want to preach for a few minutes on don't let the devil steal your heart. And I find it interesting, how could Absalom ever steal hearts away from David? David's amazing. How could the devil ever steal God's people's hearts away from the Lord? But it happens. You say, oh no, preacher, that doesn't happen. Yes, it does. The Bible said about the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, the Lord said, I have something against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Something's wrong with your heart. The devil has stole your heart. Isn't that amazing? The church at Ephesus. How could they ever let their heart get stolen? We're talking about the church at Ephesus, y'all. We're talking about the church that Paul wrote one of his greatest epistles to. The epistle of the Ephesians is one of the greatest doctrinal masterpieces to the church that has ever been written. I mean, brother, six chapters jam-packed that deal with our wealth, deal with our walk, and deal with our warfare 
as a Christian I mean brother six chapters that lets us know that we are in Christ seated in heavenly places redeemed by the blood purchased by the blood Holy Ghost living on the inside tells us about all the instruments of warfare that we're to put on and combat the devil with and yet that great church that had members like Priscilla and Aquila they were members of that church helpers of Paul had a pastor like Timothy Timothy's the pastor pastor of the church and yet that church is the church that about 30 years later was written to by the Lord Jesus Christ from the pen of John and said you've left your first love how in the world could a church that's like that that had an epistle like that get their hearts up but it does I'm telling you I'm watching God's people and churches all across the country having their hearts stole and they don't even realize it's happening, but it's happening. Don't let the devil steal your heart. How does this happen? Let me show you three things real quick and we'll go. Three things real quick. Number one, the first way I see that he stole their hearts is firstly, they were deceived by their feelings. They relied too much on feelings. They walked too much by sight, not enough by faith. They went by how did they feel? Well, watch their feelings. He deceived them with feelings. Listen to me. He deceived them with feelings of excitement. Look, look, at, look at chapter 15, verse 1. Watch how it starts. Watch what the Bible said in verse 1, chapter 15. And it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Do you see the excitement? Do you see the parade? Do you see the bluster that's going on? I mean, all of a sudden, it, the Bible said in verse 2, it was early. I mean, brother, right at the break of day, right when everyone's getting up and starting to make their way into town, all of a sudden, brother, here comes the boom boxes down the street. I mean, brother, here comes the parade down the street. Here comes 50 men running down the street, and they're the hype men. I mean, brother, they're just, they got all the excitement. They look cool. I mean, brother, they're saying, Hey, 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 yo, yo, yo. Absalom in the house. I mean, they the hype people. And all of a sudden, here come chariots. And the chariots, you know, got double do spinner rims. And, you know, boom boxes blaring out the back. You know, it's 2024, you know what I mean? And here they come, and they're doing their sideways drifting down the street, doing donuts in the street. They, you know, got the horses raining. Up. I mean, it's a parade. That's what's going on here. And all of a sudden, people say, Wow, that's exciting. Boy, that's, that's a lot more exciting than what David's got going on. Man, that looks cool. Man, that looks... Oh, let me stop right here and talk to all you young people in the house, everybody that's under 21, and let me say, you know how the devil will steal your heart? He'll do it by trying to give you something that looks exciting. That, that's, the way the, that's the way the prodigal son wound up out in the far country. He got tired of the farm, preacher Foster. He got tired of working around with daddy and got tired of just every day seeming to be the same thing. And he said, there's got to be something funner. There's got to be something cooler. There's got to be something more exciting. Look at the party. Look at the lights. Look at the girls. Look at the guys. Man, they act like they're having a big time. Let's go get some of what they've got. Man, this is fun. But what they don't see show you is where Absalom's going to lead them to. Absalom's going to lead them to destruction. Absalom's going to lead them to ruin. Absalom's going to lead them to disappointment. Absalom's going to lead them to a place of tears. Absalom's going to lead them to regret. Absalom's going to lead them to a dead end road where they say, I wish to God I'd have never fail for that trick of excitement. I'm telling you the devil plays on your feelings of I want something exciting. This preacher Foster getting up there and hollering at us every Sunday out of that same book, that ain't exciting. Hearing sisters like that sister we heard that just gets up there and sings a little old song, a cappella about heaven, that just ain't... Hearing Sister Sydney and the choir and them get up and sing them songs like this, that just ain't exciting enough. What we need is we need a we need a praise band. I'm gonna I'm gonna preach here for just a minute if you don't mind. 
I'm going to if you mind anyhow, so just hang on. What we need is somebody to get up and let's bring some excitement into this thing. Listen to me. Do you know where Absalom learned how to do what he's doing in verse 1? He didn't learn it from David. He learned it from them years he was down in Gesher. The Bible said in chapter 13, verse 37, that Absalom fled and he went and lived with a pagan king in Gesher for years. Listen to me. This isn't the way that the kings of Israel come into town. You say, how do the kings of Israel promote themselves? Go read, go read 1 Kings chapter 1. 1 Kings chapter 1, David said, when Solomon was going to be anointed king, he said, put him on my own mule and just simply walk him through the streets. What's that a picture of? That's a picture of over there where the Bible said in Zechariah, Behold, thy king cometh to thee, Jerusalem, meek and lowly, sitting upon an ass and a coat, the foal of an ass. It's a picture of Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't come in with the hype men. Jesus did. He rode just old common, ordinary mule down the street. You say, where did Absalom learn this stuff from? He learned it from the work. Don't miss this. He learned it from the world and he brought it to God's people. He learned it in Geshur, but he brought it to God's people. Y'all listen to me. I'm telling you, I am watching left and right churches that used to believe like we believe, preach like we preach, sing like we sing, have standards like we have, and do like we do. And I'm watching them bring something from Gesher into the church. They have brought the worldly sound and the worldly look and the worldly mood and the worldly spirit, and it has infected a whole generation of young people to where they live a lascivious life that doesn't look holy it's not holy it doesn't have the smack of the Holy Ghost on it it's got the smack of the world on it and what we need some more listen to me the old mules that the old men rode they're still good to ride today the old mules that the old sisters rode they're still good to ride today it may not hallelujah it may not be the most flashy thing it may not be the most exciting thing but it still gets the blessing of God and it's still It's the job done. And we don't need something exciting just for the purpose of having excitement. I'm telling you, the devil will deceive you by feelings of excitement. Boy, life's getting by me. I've got to get out there and try some of this world. That's exciting looking. No, it's not. Telling you it's going to end up leaving you beside the road somewhere. Disappointed young people. You young people sitting here, I'm telling you, the greatest thing you can do in your life is keep your heart pure, keep your mind and life right, and stay close to this preacher in this church and watch God bless your life. Feelings of excitement. I'm telling you, the devil will deceive your feelings. You can't trust your feelings. I may have told you this before, I'll tell you again. Back when I was doing my pilot's certificate and getting my pilot's license back when I was 18 years old, one of the exercises that they do getting your pilot's license is they make you fly depending on nothing but instruments. Not by how you feel, but by what the instruments say. And they put you under what's called the hood. They put this long billed hat on you that drops down on either side, stretches out way out in the front. You have no peripheral vision to see outside. You have no vision to see over the dash of the plane. All you can see are the instruments of the airplane. Your vertical uh, speed indicator, uh, your altimeter, your airspeed indicator. Uh, that's all you can see in the, in the horizontal bank of the wings. That's all you're looking at. And that instructor will tell you to close Close your eyes and he'll get the airplane all messed up. Then he'll tell you, open your eyes and then fix it according to the instruments. Now there's a reason for this. They don't just do it for no reason. The reason for this is, is you could end up flying into clouds at a certain point in your piloting career. When you get in clouds, you can't see nothing. You can't see the horizon. You can't see the ground. You can't see anything. And your body, your feelings will lie to you. 
Your inner ear will tell you you're banking and descending when in actuality you're not banking and descending to the left. You're banking and ascending to the right. Your feelings will lie to you. And many pilots have gotten into clouds and did not follow the instruments but follow what they thought their feelings felt like and they punched out of a low cloud cover and run right into the dirt and killed them and all their passengers. They teach you to fly by the instruments. And I'll never forget, Brother Jeff, I'll never forget. My daddy was my instructor for a little while before he handed me off to the CFI, the Certified Flight Instructor. This is what they always told me. They said this, Son, it doesn't matter how you feel. The instruments are always right. It don't matter how you feel. It doesn't matter what your body tells you. The instruments are always right. Fly by the instruments. Can I say tonight God's given us an instrument and it's always right. I, I know the clouds of this world have changed so much and I know the clouds have settled in and everybody now is flying by the seat of their pants and by their feelings and say, well, I think this and I think that. Y'all, we have wound up in Judges where it said every man that which was right in his own eyes. That's where we've wound up at. If you want to be gay and to be a Christian, you can. If you want to be this and that, you can be. If you want to sing a rock and roll song and do it on the platform, you can. If you want to get up in a pair of shorty shorts hiked up to your tailbone and worship God, you can. If you want to use a different version of the Bible, it don't matter how messed up it is, you can. We are so messed up today, we don't know which way is up. What we need once again is to go back to the instrument. The instrument's always been right. It's never been wrong. It'll never steer us wrong. And it doesn't matter how how exciting things are. Just stay with the instruments tonight. Amen. It's like the time I heard, like the time I heard this woman. She went, it's the Bible's what gives a defense for the devil, y'all. That woman went to a revival service one night. She went and she got all hyped up and filled up with the Lord. I mean, son, she just got right with God and felt like she could just go to heaven from right there. And she went home and went to bed. And that night she's just thinking about the Bible and the message and songs. And sometime in the middle of the night, that little old woman heard a noise in her house. She got up and she walked down the hall. And she looked down that long, dark hall. And she saw the silhouette of this great big fella in her house who wasn't supposed to be there. And she was scared to death. And she didn't know what else to do. She, I was Brother Christian. She'd been listening to preaching and thinking about the Bible. And she remembered that preacher had preached on the Scripture of the book of the Acts, chapter 2 and verse number 38, where the Bible said, Repent! And that's all she could think of. And she just hollered out, Acts 2.38! And when she said that, that big fella hit the floor like a sack of taters. I mean, just, whew. I mean, brother, like she had shot him with a gun and just laid there on the floor. She walked over to the phone, called 911. They showed up. The police arrived. There he laid in the floor. That old woman just standing over him. They picked him up. Nothing wrong with him. Handcuffed him. Took him out to the car. Got her statement. And they walked out to the car and asked him. They said, sir, we got to ask you a question. That woman's just a little old woman and she lives by herself. And, and you're a great big fella. You could have overpowered her and got whatever you want in the house. Why did you hit the floor? He said, that woman's dangerous. They said, sir... She ain't even got a weapon. He said, don't got a weapon, hogwash. She hollered out and said she had an axe and 238s. <laughs> Praise God. That's why I hit the floor. <laughs> I'm telling you, the Bible is an axe and 238s against the devil. You want to be able to fight the devil, pull out the axe and the 238s. This <laughs> Amen. They were deceived by feelings of excitement. I got to hurry real quick, but I do want to say this to you as well. These weren't just feelings of excitement. They were deceived easily. How come they were deceived easily with their feelings? Listen to me. I'll tell you why. Because he told them what they wanted to hear. I'm telling you how the devil will steal your heart by putting somebody or something in your life that tells you exactly what you want to hear. The Bible said this in verse number 2 that when anyone had a controversy, didn't matter what kind of controversy it was, when they came to the king for judgment, Absalom would meet him. And watch what Absalom would say in verses 3. Verse 3, Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right 
you got a real point there. Now, I think you're right. But wait a minute. I thought to myself, what if their matters weren't good and right? It didn't matter. Absalom would just tell them, you're right. It don't matter if you're an idiot. Some of these people, if they'd have showed up to David, David would have looked at them and said, you're stupid, you're wrong, and you need to change the way you're thinking. But not Absalom. Everybody that showed up to Absalom, he'd just say, you're right. Ever what you think, you're right, and I'm on your side. And he said this, but there's no man deputed of the king to hear thee. Absalom said moreover oh, that I were made judge in the land that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me and I would do him justice so on and so forth do you see how he deceived them he didn't just deceive their feelings by excitement he deceived their feelings easily because he told them what they wanted to hear y'all listen to me the devil will steal your heart by getting you to a place where you listen to nothing but only that which backs up what you want Y'all listen to me. That's why we need men like your pastor that'll stand up every week and preach the Bible to you whether you like it or not. That's why you need to read the Bible every day of your life so that you can get something that contradicts what you think and what I think. I listen to preaching every day of my life. You say, why? Because I need somebody to get in my face, get in my space, and contradict the wrong thinking of my mind and of my heart many times. Y'all, y'all listen, especially you young people. Y'all young people, listen to me. I've been around long enough to watch this happen. There, there's some of you young girls that some of y'all, when you've got an issue or when you've got something going on, you know who not to go to because they're going to tell you the way it is. There's, there are some girls in, my, in our church, they done figured out, don't go talk to Miss Tristan and don't go talk to Miss Amanda and don't go talk to some of these ladies. You know why? They'll tell you exactly the way it is. So you know what you do? You go find the most backslid heifer in the church. Yeah, I, I said the most backslid heifer in the church. That she's rebellious to her husband. She's rebellious to the pastor. She ain't got no spiritual discernment whatsoever. And you'll go ask her, what do you think about this? What's the matter what she thinks about it? She backs it as a devil. Won't you go find you a lady that's lived for God, turned some children out for Jesus, and actually got some spiritual discernment? Amen. Young, young fellas, listen to me, young men. Don't, don't, don't run get advice. Don't, when you need a real serious matter helped in your life, get these boys to pray for you, but do yourself a favor. Listen to me. Don't get advice from them. You know why? They ain't got no more sense than you got. I love y'all, but they ain't got no more sense than you got. You know who you ought to go to? Find you a spiritual man, preferably your pastor. Find a deacon. Find some man the church loves God, serve the Lord, got some snow on top of his hair somewhere, and go to him and say what do you think about this I'm telling you the devil will put people in your life to where you say well I'm just going to talk to the person that will tell me what I want to hear and if you don't think the devil won't put people in your life even in church you've lost your mind I'm talking about the devil will deceive your feelings how does he deceive the heart by using our feelings against us I got to hurry. I done got hung up too long on that point. Let's go to number two. This one's a little better. We'll get to something a little more happy. Praise God. Not only do we see that he deceived them by their feelings, but secondly, how did he steal their heart? David was forgotten. <laughs> There's only one way other than deceiving their feelings. I can figure that he got their hearts, Preacher Foster. They just plumb forgot about David. And I thought to myself, how could you forget David? How could you forget David? Brother Phil, it was David that had slew their giants. Boy, I'm telling you, there, how could they forget 1 Samuel 17? How could they forget there was a day when nobody, including Saul, nobody would step out on a battlefield against a nine-foot-tall giant, but there was this little boy who walked out on the battlefield with a heart full of God and a gut full of I don't give a rip, yanked his sling out, pulled out five smooth stones from the brook, laid one in the sling round and round, then went, slumped that thing the giant in the head, chopped his head off one. How could they forget David had slew the giant? How could they forget that they had sung about David in songs? 
David was the object of their praise and their songs. David slew the giant. They come back in 1 Samuel 18 and they sing this. This is what they sing. Saul had slain his thousands, but David is 10,000. How could you forget you've been singing about him? All them songs you sung, how could you forget them? How could they forget? Hang with me now, I'm going somewhere. How could they forget it was David that settled the nation? The nation was in turmoil. When Saul died, the Philistines had run of the country. I mean, brother, the nation was upside down. But when David came to the throne in 2 Samuel, brother, he settled the nation, brought prosperity to the nation. He didn't just settle the nation. He's the one that sought the presence of God for the nation. Remember the ark of God was down yonder in another land and it was David that said we need God here let's put the presence let's put the presence of God right here so we can be near God hey it was David that went seeking and saving the old crippled boy Mephibosheth from down how could they forget David had showed grace on the crippled that David had brought the crippled to the table and put him as one of the king's sons ain't no the king ever done that but David did and somehow they had just plumb forgot all the good things that David had done and y'all listen to me tonight you know how the devil steals our heart it's when we forget how good the Lord Jesus has been to us it's when we forget all the things Jesus has done for us I mean y'all look back down the dusty road of life has he not slain the giants that was in front of you how many times have there been things too big and yet Jesus stepped up to the plate and brought it down to size and gave you victory time after time remember we've sung about him in songs how could we forget all the songs we've sung how could we forget all the times that we've lifted him up and praised him and gave him glory how could we forget that when our soul and our kingdom was troubled when Jesus moved in he brought the presence of God put the Holy Ghost on the inside how could we forget that we're the crippled boys that was down yonder in Lodi Bar and the Son of God came seeking and saved and put us at the king's table how could we forget how good Jesus has been here we sit tonight clothes on our back, shoes on our feet food in our belly, a little money in our pocket, a car in the parking lot, heaven is our home God's our father, Jesus our savior, sitting in the house of God and it's all because of Jesus it's all because of Jesus not one of us can say it's because of me, not one of you can say that it's because of you, but we simply bow our unworthy head, lift our unworthy hands, and say, Thank you, Lord. Look what God has done. And somehow we forget. Somehow we live long enough in this thing, Brother Jeff, and we start thinking, I'm a pretty good Christian. And look what I've done. No, you're. You and I both just sorry worm bait. And the Lord has stepped in our life and been so good to us. And He deserves my whole heart for my whole life. You say, preacher, I know how good the Lord's been to me. I would never let the devil steal my heart. Hey, listen to him. Watch, watch your book. It didn't happen overnight, y'all. We stopped in verse 6. Would you move on to verse 7? 2 Samuel 15, 7. Verse 6 said that Absalom stole her heart. Look at verse 7. And it came to pass after 40 years. It don't happen overnight. I'm telling you, the devil don't have to get your heart overnight. He can get it piece by piece. Bit by bit. Little by little. I don't know why the Lord's got me shooting down the rabbit hole to young people tonight. Maybe it's because we got so many of them in here. I like that. That's a blessing. I've been to a bunch of churches. There ain't none of them. Who, brother, that's a blessing. The youth department's a blessing. Y'all are working in the youth, and that's a testament to this church. Thank God. It's wonderful. But you young people, listen to me. I can't tell you. For years and years now, I've preached to youth camps a long, long time. I'm aged out of them now, but they keep having me come back. I like it. I think I'm a perpetual camper in some of these places. I want to stay that way. But I've watched this. I've watched young one year, 
a young girl or a young boy, Brother Christian, show up 13, 14 years old, real tender heart toward the things of God, cry, weep, make decisions for the Lord, come to the altar. Then I watch the next year. They go from 14 to 15. There's a little less movement. They're too cool for it now, and I see them hooking up with the wrong friends, even in the youth group. Then I watch them get around 16, 17. Not, not always, not always, but then I watch all of a sudden some of them, man, they show up and there ain't no more conviction at all. You couldn't blast them out of their seat with dynamite. And brother, that little girl that used to be tender towards the Lord and the Lord had her heart at 13 and 14, now she's 16, 17. That young boy that had a heart and stood up at youth camp and said, I'm called to preach and I want to be a preacher at 14 and 15. Now he's 17 and 18. And I'm telling you, I watched bit by bit. It didn't happen overnight, but bit by bit, the devil just got more and more and more of their heart till they absolutely have no desire for the things of God anymore. You better be careful. The devil steal your heart bit by bit. Can I tell you though, listen to me mom and daddy. I like this fellow that shows up in the story in chapter 15. There's a fellow that shows up brother and he makes his mind up. Me and mine, we ain't letting Absalom have none of us. Me and mine, we hanging with the king. Watch this, I like this guy. Watch this fella. Verse 19, 2 Samuel 15, 19. We run into the end. We getting close to the close. Watch here. Verse 19. Well, start in verse 18. Verse 18. And all his servants passed on beside him. This is David. He has to run from Absalom. And he's on the run. Said all his servants passed on beside him. Verse 18. All the Carathites and all the Pelathites and all the Gittites. 600 men which came after him from Gath. These are those men that David... <laughs> these are them men that David picked up while he was living in the land of the Philistines when he was running from Saul. They're still with him 30 years later. Watch here, 600 men which came after him from Gath passed on before the king. Then said the king to Atai the Gittite, Watch Atai, Wherefore goest thou also with us? Return to thy place and abide with the king. For thou art a stranger and also an exile, whereas thou camest but yesterday. Should I this day make thee go up and down with us, seeing I go whither I may? I don't know how rough the road's going to get, Atai. Might be some tough days ahead if you hang out with, if you hang out with the king. Might be some tough days ahead. Might not always be easy. He said, "You just go back. Take back your brethren. Mercy and truth be with thee." Verse 21. Watch it, Tai. And I tell you, I answered the king and said, "As the Lord liveth, and as my Lord the king liveth, surely in what place my Lord the king shall be, whether in li death or life, even there also will thy servant be. And David said to Atai, go and pass over. Watch it. I like the last part of verse 22. Watch this, mom and daddy. And Atai the Gittite passed over and all his men. Hey, hey. And all the little ones that were with him. Oh, Atai, he ain't a Jew. He's a Gentile. Oh, take, you know why he wants to stay with David? Because he says this. I remember when I was nothing but an old Gentile dog living down. The Bible said he's from Gath. Y'all, that's where Goliath's from. Oh, Goliath's dead and in hell. But I tell you, I is hanging out with the king, shouting the glory of God. And I tell you, I says, you know why I'm going to stay with you, king? Because when I was living down there as a Gentile, didn't know nothing about the God of Israel. God brought you into my life. You've made a difference in my life. And I'm not just going to hang with you. I'm bringing my youngins too. I mean the whole family. We're going to stick it out with the king because you've been so good to us. You know what the Lord needs. You know what Emmanuel Baptist Church needs. It needs some mamas and daddies and grandmas and papas that'll tell the Lord you got our whole heart for our whole life. You come got us way off down there when we were lost in our sin and we want our babies to get around the old time religion. We want our babies to be around the things of God and we are with the king for our whole life. Amen. Amen. Oh, I tell you, I probably said something like this. I started a journey many years ago. 
I was looking for rest and peace for my soul. Well, I found it at Calvary, and truly I say, it's satisfied then and gets better each day. Well, I think I'll just go with God. Or looking back my way, I don't see a lot. With Him there is joy and blessings untold. So I think I'll just go with God. Oh, like that's a good one. Think another verse of it. My road was littered with sin and despair. But God's way is filled with sweet, tender care. I found Him a faithful, compassionate friend. So my course is set. I'm going to finish with Him. Make your mind up. I'm going with God. I'm staying with the Lord. I'm staying with the Bible. I'm staying with the church. This new stuff got nothing for me. I'm not looking for an exciting way. I'm not looking for a new way. I'm looking for the old path. Where is the good way? I'm looking to walk with God with my whole heart tonight. How could the devil steal our heart? Deceived by the feelings. David's forgotten. I'm done. But I want you to notice this. These men that had their heart stole, we find they made a decision that got their heart fixed. There's a decision that got their heart fixed. Go with me to chapter 19, and we're through. This is our last text tonight, chapter 19. There's a decision that got their heart fixed. Listen to me. Many of these men that allowed the devil, Absalom, to steal their heart, you know what happened to a whole bunch of them? 20,000 of them to be exact. Chapter 18, verse 7 said 20,000 of them were slaughtered. I imagine they thought, Brother Doug, when they was getting slaughtered, I never thought it in this way. Man, when Absalom was talking so smooth and so slick and making it look so good, I never thought it would end here. The devil never does show you the end. He don't ever show you how it ends up. A bunch of them died, but watch some of the rest of them. Chapter 19, verse number 9. Chapter 19, verse 9. They made a decision that got their heart fixed. You can make a decision that will fix your heart tonight. Verse 9, And all the people were at strife. That's what happens when David doesn't rule on the throne. When the Lord Jesus is not on the throne of your heart, there's strife in your life. And all the people were at strife throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king saved us out of the hand of our enemies, and he delivered us out of the hand of the Philistines. And now he has fled out of the land for Absalom. And Absalom, you say, how do you know these guys were on the wrong side of this thing? Watch verse 10. And Absalom, whom we anointed over us, is dead in battle. Hey, y'all, we done made a bad choice. We let somebody who didn't deserve any part of our heart have some of it. And we're, we're, we're wrong for it. We need to get back to David. And hear what they said. Now therefore, verse 10, why speak you not a word of bringing the king back? Verse 11. And King David sent to Zadok and to Bithar the priest, saying, Speak unto the elders of Judah, saying, Why are ye the last to bring back the, house, the, the king to his house? Seeing the speech of all Israel has come to the king, even to his house. Ye are my brethren. Look at how New Testament church age this is. Ye are my brethren. Ye are my bones and my flesh. Yo, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're his bones and his flesh. Ephesians 5 says so. Wherefore then are you the last to bring back the king? Verse 13. And say ye to Amasa, Art thou not of my bone and of my flesh? God do so to me and more also, if thou be not captain of the host before me continually in the room of Joab. Watch verse 14. David makes this plea to his people, and watch what the Bible said happened to them. Verse 14. And he bowed the heart of all the men of Judah, even as the heart of one man, so that they sent this word unto the king, We want you back. Return thou and all thy servants, so the king return. Do you see the decision? This is what your Bible said in verse 14, that he bowed the heart. 
That word bow, it, it literally carries the meaning of like a, a bow that you shoot an arrow out of. That literally he took their heart with his words and turned it around. It was this way and he bowed it back another way. You know what the Lord does through preaching of his word? Just like the words of the king. I've preached to you the words of the king tonight. You know what the Lord uses tonight to, to get our heart? He uses preaching. And he takes our hearts when they're out of whack and when they're pointed in the wrong direction. And he says, no, not that way. Come back this way. No, 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 no. It's, your, your heart's getting out, of, getting out of bounds that way. Bow it back this way. Let's make a decision to get your heart fixed. And tonight, on the first night of revival, maybe it would just be a good idea to get around the altar and say, Lord, there's a certain area of my life. Maybe not everything's out of whack. But Lord, this part of my heart or that part of my heart, and Mama doesn't know or Daddy doesn't know or my husband or my wife doesn't know, the pastor doesn't know, nobody needs to know. We're not Catholics. We don't believe you've got to come confess everything to us. we got a high priest. Tell it to Jesus. And tonight you can hit the confessional booth. And don't tell the dress-wearing priest. Tell the high priest of heaven. Say, Lord, this area of my life is not right. Bow my heart back. Turn my heart back towards you. God, I don't want my heart or my life to start looking at things that I think are more exciting than you. Y'all, they started looking at things that they thought were more exciting than David. And the devil will get us looking at things that we think is more exciting than Jesus. There ain't nothing. That ain't good English, but it's good theology. There ain't nothing better than Jesus. Nothing. And tonight I wonder if you wouldn't get around the altar and just say, Lord, bow my heart. Sister Sid, you reckon you'd sing that song? I, I think that was of the Lord that you sung that he loved us with all his heart before I preached tonight. Would you sing that for invitation tonight? And I wonder if you wouldn't get around the altar and say, Lord, bow my heart back in the direction that it needs to be. I don't want the devil to steal any part of my heart. Let's all stand tonight. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Father. I pray that you'd take the few scattered and feeble words that I've tried to preach to these people tonight and bow our hearts with it. Fix our hearts back on the Lord Jesus. How could we ever forget how good you've been to us? Lord, everything we have is because of you. Lord, we can't claim that we've done anything by ourselves. It's all because of Jesus. Lord, I pray tonight that you would help us to fix our heart on you like you set your heart upon us help us to be people after your heart in jesus name we pray amen if you, if you enjoyed today's message head on over to ibcforums.com and click on sermons and don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast as always thanks for listening